quick introduction. So I'm Vladimir Fazer, and I'm going to talk about to you about some uh, strain sensors for um, lightweight epidermal uh, sensing, which is a little bit different from what we've been hearing about before because we actually want to do sensing on the body. So why are we interested in doing sensing on the body? Well, um, there's actually a lot of benefits for um, improving the quality of life uh, when we do sensing on the body. And this has been realized in the past two decades uh, in examples for fracture fixation hardware, which is something like this tibia rod, which you put into a, a leg when you have a fracture. So with improvement, we're putting strain sensors on those devices. They have improved the device of these, so they last longer. And you can actually, they've actually monitored um, healing of the bone in situ with the strain sensors without taking x-rays or going to a doctor, which is doing strain measurements, which is nice. So we want to do the same thing for on-body sensing because that hasn't been done as much. So what can be done with on-body sensing? Well, some of the benefits of it is health monitoring. Just by monitoring, um, for example, you know, you can measure the pulsation on your body from looking at the arterial pulsation. Well, you can measure pulsation on your body by measuring arterial pulsation on your skin. You can also put a strain sensor on your chest and you can measure chest expansion and contraction. So you can measure respiration, which is important for um, certain diseases, uh, um, child onset, child sudden onset death, or similar, yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, and then um, also, you can measure the speech by putting a strain sensor on your throat. Um, it can be translated to speech. Um, another important application that I'm interested in is rehabilitation. So that's where you put sensors on the body and look at the strain or exerted to it with different motion or throughout the day, and you can quantify how much strain is exerted by a person with different motion, or also track how much strain they exert in certain region of their air body over the span of the day. So then you can say, well, this person has a habit that contributes to their back pain because they do these activities, and you can tailor their daily activity to produce less back pain. And with recent advances in technology, it's also quite interesting that there's a lot of applications for human uh, machine interfaces, and this is not just robotic hand um, applications that we've been hearing about with tactile sensors are important, but this is more of also virtual reality, where you want to translate human input, you know, of bending your hands into some kind of signal that you can use in virtual reality. Um, and that becomes very complicated. So most of these sensors, the way they work is um, they work on piezoresistive effects. So you have a uh, conducting material that is encapsulated into elastomer. As elastomer is deformed, usually you, it's elongated, so you have chain, your the length of your resistor increases, so your resistance also increases. And also from the negative Poisson ratio, your cross-section decreases, so your resistance also increases. So that's basically one of the main methods to measure uh, strain with resistance. It is also possible in examples of carbon nanotubes to look at overlap and uh, interconnects between them because as you strain um, you know, a bundle of carbon nanotubes, they slide past each other and reduce the number of interconnects and overlap between them and resistance also increases. Uh, and it's also possible, as we've heard before, take advantage of um, 3D structures so you can have nanorods that are interconnected and as they deform, the overlap between them increases and then you can translate that to resistance and strain. So, but because we work with on-body sensors, there's a lot of limitations to what sensors we can actually use. And primary ones come because uh, we need to be skin compatible. And our first order principle, we want to have uh, our strain, strain sensor B have similar mechanical response to skin, which starts with Young's modulus being similar, because if you have very large Young's modulus, then your strain sensor is not going to deform, and actually the skin will deform around, so you'll actually limit the motion of the person and the motion that you're trying to sense. Um, another big problem is that um, you know, skin has a linear response up to 15% strain and then ruptures around 25-30%. But if you look at your hand, you can move it around and you'll notice parts of your hand that move actually experience like 100% strain. And that's because you have wrinkling and skin uh, moves. And that is, that place a big restriction on sensors because a lot of sensors that are based on uh, silicon technology, they're limited to 2 and 5% uh, strain. And you can do some clever engineering to get maybe up to 20, but you're not going to be able to to accommodate the 100% strain that you see there. And then you could think, well, you could do miniature miniaturization, but that isn't also a solution because then uh, if you look at your hand, there's also features like wrinkles. So if you miniaturize, then you, what are you going to be measuring? You could be measuring the wrinkle, which doesn't actually translate to large uh, scale motion. Uh, another factor that we're concerned about is skin sweat permeability. It's because we're going to have sensors on the skin and we would like to have them for an extended period of time. And we do not want to have buildup of moisture at 
the interface and irritate the user where they have to take it off. Um, another important factor is small form factor for our sensor, so we, they don't need to be bulky, they need to be all encompassing, they have the battery, everything inside. We don't want the user carrying our car battery just so it can get a measurement of you know, their respiration. Um, also, they need to be easy to use and universal, and that comes in with these kind of sensors where there's a lot of sensors mounted on uh, for the knuckle, they're mounted in different locations, but each person's knuckle is going to be in a different place, different people need different size gloves, so there's a lot of, you cannot make a glove for each person with individually placed sensors that would take too long and cost too much, and they will be prohibitive to sensors. Um, another reason that these, uh, the gloves are frequently used is because sometimes uh, nano engineer materials are used, such as carbon nanotubes, which are not the greatest for your health, um, which is why they need all this these protective layers to protect the user from it. And for mobility uh, applications, this is actually very unfavorable because sometimes we want to improve, uh, measure the physical therapy of people with limited mobility, and their mobility will not actually allow them to put on the glove. So we want something that is very easy to apply that does not require uh, much uh, from the user to take the measurement. And most importantly, we want to go beyond digital detection. Um, but I mean, the digital detection, you know, that's respiration, pulse, that is all looking at the signal in time domain. We actually want to see motion and we are actually want to say, well, okay, this person has bent their finger 10 degrees, 20 degrees. So we want to quantify, which is a big challenge for this field. So why is it a big field? Why is it a big problem to measure strain? Well, as I mentioned, you know, if we look at just bending the finger, bend finger around the knuckle, you get non-uniform strain over this area. You have three different strains just for this measurement. And um, actually, the majority of the motion that we actually care about is out of plane bending. And most of the sensors are calibrated with in plane stretching, which is not related to what we, it's not of interest to our measurements. So, what we want is a sensor that is, um, we doesn't deform much in plane, but has a lot of out of uh, plane bending and response. And when we talk about that right away, uh, what comes to mind is a meandering trace, which is what we've seen uh, in other talks before. It's we have a trace that moves back and forth, um, and the critical angle here is alpha or theta, as it's defined in this drawing, but we define it as alpha. So as alpha increases, the curve of the strain increases. So when you stretch it, um, the trace just uncoils, and then when it comes to a certain um, strain, then it fails. So the bigger this coiling angle, the more you can deform it until you actually get to a critical a dimension of 115 degrees or 25 degrees for our method of measuring. And that's where contraction from Poisson, uh, contraction of your substrate causes compression failure of your trace. So you don't want it too big of a curvature, but you just want it just right. Um, there are also other parameters to consider, which is the width of the trace and uh, the ratio of width, radius to width and the length here. But that is primarily, that does affect the mechanical properties, but that is actually going to be mainly determined by the tray, your circuit. Because that will actually just increase the size of your circuit and increase the resistance. So you cannot tune those independently of the trays. So uh, before we start talking about how we made this sensor, we want to talk about what material do we actually make it out. So frequently people make it out of PDMS, but we actually would like to get away from PDMS because it uh, has some unfavorable characteristics. Um, so here we compared PDMS to 3M Tegadrum, polyurethane substrate, and 3M uh, Tegadrum is a commercial bandage that is available. It is used in hospitals to um, cover wounds, to keep eyeballs in place during surgery. So it is very biocompatible and approved for use um, on body. So we did some um, sweat simulant solution transmission uh, measurements to see how much uh, transmission permeability we have through our substrate. And for Tegaderm, we have very good transmission, which Tegaderm is actually a 20 micron thick film with a 20 micron uh, thick adhesive. And for PDMS films that are 350 microns and 500 microns, we have much lower permeability. And these are the typical thicknesses that people use in order to be able to encapsulate all of their carbon nanotubes safely. Um, so, of course, you can bring this uh, thickness down, but then it becomes very hard to work with. That's been the PDMS. Um, so, also, PDMS likes to absorb water and small molecules, which could be a problem if there are some toxins or drugs um, that will actually stay in the PDMS. And also, we like polyurethane because it's easy to make uh, film blends with other additives. So now we want to talk about how we actually made the sensor. So we made the sensor using the, these meandering traces. Um, we just used shadow mask deposition to deposit metal 
from gold in this case on various other ATM substrates. We used um, 100 millimeter substrates so we can actually fabricate a lot of sensors at once and then on the adhesive uh, this polymer is a substrate, so this is like small little bandages that you can take off, peel off on any surface you ever measure. And the way we measure them is we made connections to these traces with uh, this flexible polymer uh, board. We used an isotropic Z axis tape to attach to it. Um, so it's very easy to do. There's not much uh, that is needed from the user to take this measurement. Um, and for our bench top measurements, we use the weed cell bridge and we use the National Instrument MyDeck for data acquisition. And this is kind of wheatstone bridge with a serpentine trace here. And for all of our measurements, we use the bending test because, as I mentioned earlier, the linear strain test is not very relevant to our measurements because that is has large variation and that is not the measurement that we actually care about. So first, we made um, these meandering traces with a stiffener. So these are the traces that we made with uh, polyurethane. We have a gold uh, chrome metal layer, and then we have a stiffener, a polymer stiffener underneath that, and um, when we did a bending response, you know, this is um, bending 10 cycles of bending and releasing around a large radius and then going out to smaller. And we see very small response. You don't even see that there's 10 cycles. If you squint very hard, you might be able to see that. Um, so there's, it's not very good responsivity and there's very small change in resistance, about 1%, which is half an ohm, which has a lot of signal to noise ratio, which we don't like. And for wearable sensors where you cannot do a lot of on-body data processing, this is not very favorable. But where this is uh, favorable is if you actually make the circuit like this, if you deform it, there's not gonna be much change in your resistance. So while this is not a great strain sensor material, this is great uh, layout to do in a wearable sensor circuit that can deform. So then we went back and we made a much simpler circuit without any stiffener. So this is just polyurethane with gold on top of it. And when we, when we did the bending test from large uh, bending, Radius to smaller to larger again. You can see 10 cycles are clearly visible. They're very reproducible. Um, and we have very good response and it increases with um, smaller curvature of radius. Well, a smaller radius of curvature. Um, and we get stable measurements. There's a little bit of drift here that you can see. And that's due to polymer relaxation and some initial uh, plastic deformation in the substrate. So if we plot the response uh, versus different strain angle, uh, trace angle that we wanted to investigate. So negative 15 degrees and zero degrees, which are these two, um, they have some of linear response, which is very favorable. And we can re correlate that response with the bending angle, which is nice. But uh, it was surprising to see that for 25 degree trace angle, there was poor responsivity. There was large uh, variation at that small radius of bending. Um, so from these two traces, we can tell that, well, it's possible that this um, trace angle is actually favorable for this operating region, and this trace angle is favorable for this operating region. So then when we do on-body testing, we can either use multiple sensors, or we can just select the angle that we want for the different appendage that we're measuring. Um, so we can tune it to the testing we want to do. So that result, the bad result of 25 degree angle uh, having large uh, variation in the measurement was very surprising because if you remember, we go back to previous um, data where we said that if you increase your trace angle, you should have um, more resilience to strain. But we actually see the opposite, that we have more susceptible to deformation from strain. And that's because, once again, we're not looking at linear strain, we're looking at bending strain. So for that, if we look at, um, we have auto plane bending. So if we look at cross-sectional area, if we increase the, this uh, trace angle, our auto plane bending, uh, auto plane cross-section, well, cross-section that is susceptible to auto plane bending, it increases. So as compared to the other trace angles where it doesn't increase. And in addition, this is also not uniform increase. So then it becomes susceptible to where you put on the body. So if you put it across the rainfall, it's gonna be more susceptible than if you don't put it across the rainfall. So this is not a favorable design. And then it's contrary to what's been said before about um, in regard to linear deformation. So then we would go to pull it on the body. We've actually developed a, a flexible board for this. We have a polyamid uh, flexible board that has a DLE chip with, for data acquisition and sending it out, and there's a small battery underneath. So all of this is uh, flexible and not stretchable, so it doesn't deform, and this is the only part that deforms. So it's very nice, and it's still bandage like and compact. You can see it's a two-centimeter package for everything. Um, and now we're moving to our new Gen 2 board based on what we learned from the first trace, which was a terrible strain sensor, but it turned out to be very good circuit board material, so we're actually making this stretchable circuit based on the previous design where we have small deformation due to um, strain 
and then put in the string sensor here on the other designs so we can actually perform. So um, in summary, <clears throat> we demonstrated a bending radius sensor on wearable substrate. We showed that the large straight angle is actually not favorable for bending applications. And we are integrating this onto a flexible platform and also moving to, we hope to move to online testing once we get IRB approval for this work. So I want to acknowledge uh, the people who helped make the work, this work happen. Most of the work was done in Biointerface Lab uh, of Professor Dr. Michael Daniel. The integrated circuit with the, on the flexible circuit on the flexible substrate was done in Bionics Lab of Dr. Alper Bosker. And this is our group. And some of the funding for the, the circuit came from DARPA. And we have some other work also. We have a wearable straight uh, temperature sensor. We are working on flexible inorganic um, electronics, LEDs, and photo detectors for these circuits, and a perspiration sensor called tomorrow. Thank you.